Imagine being given an opportunity to explore part of nature that no one has ever seen, or very few people. I'm talking about the inside of a volcano that's active, the center of the Earth, the deepest trenches, outer space. Well, I had just such an opportunity after working for many years developing instruments to measure change, acid rain, global warming, ozone depletion, really weather instruments, but scientific grade. The Navy came to me after I wrote them a white paper, and they said, hey, we want you to help us work on this problem. We, we can predict where hurricanes are going, but we can't predict what they'll do when they get there. That is the intensity. So a large scientific community has been working on this for many decades, and this was an incredible opportunity. So if you remember back from science class, hurricanes are these devastating storms. They're massive, but no two storms are the same. And it turns out that they only start away from the equator. They need warm water, high sea surface temperatures, cooperative winds in the upper air, we call the upper part of the storm, and you also have to have uh, high humidity and a series of cooperating factors that lead to genesis. And once they get going, the Coriolis effect sets in. In the northern hemisphere, they spin counterclockwise. In the southern hemisphere, the other way. And the trick is, it's a heat engine. The sun is really the, the engine that pushes the storm forward. So the warm water at the base gets pulled up into the eye and thrust out the top in what's called the outflow. Now, we've been flying into hurricanes for many years. And here's an example of... Uh, uh, the hurricane tracks from the season of 2015 for the Atlantic Basin. And you can see that the storm tracks kind of are random. And sometimes, you know, one will shoot from the east coast of the United States over to Europe, and some of them will die out in the middle of the ocean. But you don't hear about a lot of these until they make landfall. Because when they make landfall, bad things happen. It turns out, out in the deep ocean, the deep water below what's called the thermocline regulates the intensity of these storms. Now take a look at that red trace near Cuba. That storm we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes was Hurricane Joaquin. It turned out to be a Category 4. It went down towards Cuba, and it took a 180, and it headed straight north. So this is Howie Bluestein in the lower left. He's a professor in Oklahoma. And when he was, at the same time I was a student here in the early 80s, he developed the Totable Tornado Observatory with Al Bedard, a colleague at NOAA. And the idea was to put this thing out in front of a tornado, and hopefully it would measure the intensity. He tried this for a couple of years, and he finally concluded this is, A, going to be statistically impossible to get in front of a tornado, but B, if I do, I'm going to kill myself or one of my colleagues. So he sort of gave up on it. But he actually got an entire generation of students interested in science and meteorology, which was a great, great contribution. So about 10, 12 years later, in 1996, the movie Twister came out, and that's Helen Hunt playing the scientist Joe, and she's trying to deploy Dorothy, which was really Toto. And I wrote a paper, or our team wrote a paper, to the Navy saying, hey, let's do Dorothy from above. Let's fly an airplane over it. By the way, the movie got a lot of things right, except for the flying cows. Cows don't fly, people fly. If you haven't seen Twister, I highly recommend it. It's a very popular film back in 96, a lot of fun. So we had been playing with these disposable weather sensors called dropsons, and the idea with this thing is that it falls, and it takes what's a data set called a sounding. So it transmits back to the de delivery vehicle. You can also put these on a balloon. It goes up or it comes down. It's the same thing. But as it falls, or as it goes up with the balloon, it measures the wind speed in the direction. It also measures the pressure, temperature, humidity. It's a little weather station, and expendable, and it runs off a battery. And we've had experience, here we are, playing around with one at the University of Massachusetts nearby on a nice day. We're going to, about to launch the weather balloon. By the way, that's Todd Allen near the cylinder tank with the yellow shirt on. He's one of the engineers. He's class of 1980. And uh, we're, we're basically on a nice day trying to collect this data and experiment and tweak the instrument and get the engineering right. By the way, the data is often presented in this chart in the, on the lower left corner. It's called a skew T, and that's essentially all the parameters plotted together. That's what meteorologists care about. Now jump to uh, Professor Kerry Emanuel here. He's class in 1973. He's an MIT uh, meteorology professor. And he challenged the Navy with this sort of grand science problem. He said, look, the Earth is spherical. 
Galaxies are spherical. Hurricanes are spherical. All the laws of nature have to do with radius and distance. And here we are using gridded computer models. Why are we doing this? Why don't we use uh, spherical equations? So he had a very different way, and he sort of pioneered this idea of predicting hurricanes. But he said, unfortunately, I need to know this number. I need to know the ocean atmospheric coupling of energy. That is the warmth at the water mixing in with the air temperature, the thermodynamic forces, and also the momentum, that is the wind and the waves, coupling. And he said, if I could get this measurement, all you have to do is go down to the base of the eye wall and get it. <laughs> now, it turns out that's a pretty deadly area. The winds can be very, very high there. In fact, it's very hard to even measure them. We don't even know how high they are. And we started out thinking, oh, what could possibly go wrong? This sounds like fun. And like many things in life, you get into a problem, and you all of a sudden realize, oh, man, why did I agree to do this? So we, we kept at it, and uh, after a, a brief time, we realized you can't design a one-size-fits-all robot to do this. You have many different types of aircraft. You have jets, you have turboprops. Some fly low, and they're not pressurized. But these are all the, the commonly used types of aircraft. The lower right-hand corner, the Air Force Reserves fly routinely the Hurricane Hunters, they're Hercules, very tough plane, about 10,000 feet altitude into the hurricane, and they make a couple of measurements. So they're dropping drop signs by hand. I should add that we weren't the first to do this by any stretch. This had been done manually. What we were doing is high definition. That is, many sensors with very high sampling speed. So this was the little beginning of the robot. Uh, we, we thought we'd call it the airborne sounding system at first, but everything needs a good acronym to get funded, so we ended up calling it the ADD, which is a little side joke, as most people know I'm ADD. But the ADD is, consists of a drum and a bunch of custom electronics and a radio receiver, and it's a sort of a soda machine. It, it drops the sons, uh, which are cylindrical, about the size of a soda can, and it drops them, and as they fall, they transmit back to the plane. So it went through many iterations. On the top of this picture, this was an early prototype. We had a pressurized version, you can kind of see I'm, I'm testing a hand-dropped one on the DC-8, which is like a jetliner, which has a tube, and you open it and drop it out. So we did lots of testing, called flight testing, over a period of years. You're looking at about five years of engineering time. So it took a long time to kind of get to the point where we could do something real. And then along, uh, one of the things is the Navy often gives you just enough rope to hang yourself. By the way, it's the Office of Naval Research funded us. And they're, they're our nation's oldest research laboratory. They've done a lot of important things. And they said, oh, by the way, you have to do an intercomparison because nobody's going to believe you if you have this sensor, this new system, and it doesn't compare. So you have to be uh, ready to defend your data. So here's an intercomparison we did on the Navy Twin Otter off the coast of California. And after a lot of work, it, it compared quite well. And we had to develop cameras to watch, make sure the sensor wouldn't hit the airplane, a lot of details. Here we are at 12 miles up. 62,000 feet, and if you look carefully at the top center of the screen, there's one of the sensors going out at 450 miles an hour. And it turns out getting the sensor out the door is only half the problem, because half the time they would self-destruct, because they're very lightweight. They're mostly uh, styrofoam and paper, and that turned out to be quite a challenge to get to work. By the way, that's the view of Hurricane Erica in uh, 2015. We finally got to this plane. They, they really wanted us to get to a drone, but one of the parts of this story is the road kept changing. It was like the yellow brick road. And every year something happened, no money or the plane was down. So we didn't end up going to a drone. We went to this plane. Now, this is one of the most famous planes in our history that you've never heard of. We've all heard of the U-2. This is the WB-57, which is able to fly at about the same height. But take a look at the size of the jet engines. They're about the diameter of the fuselage. <laughs> This plane looks like something out of Star Wars, and there's only three left flying. It used to be an Air Force bomber, and this is a case where we, we hammered swords into plowshares. We've turned this into a scientific laboratory in the sky. And uh, basically, the, the dispenser became a double unit because this plane costs $100,000 a day to fly. So we didn't want to have any unnecessary return to base scenarios because unlike the jetliner where I could walk over and turn a screw or adjust a knob, you can't do that because you can't, there's no one on the plane. It's literally like a UAV. So it's a single pilot airplane uh, with a backseat navigator. And it's quite a crew to run it. So standing next to me is uh, astronaut Greg Johnson, who was the uh, pilot on the shuttle that 
on the mission STS-125 that went up and repaired the Hubble Space Telescope. So he's a retired Navy uh, captain, uh, Air Navy test pilot. He's been to space many times. If ever there was a true life MacGyver, this guy was it. We had the best pilots in the business working for us. And uh, notice the little air conditioner packs. It's about 100 degrees in the shade in Houston where this picture was taken. Uh, Todd Allen is in the green shirt, far left. He did a lot of the firmware design, the electronics design. And Dr. Lee Harrison of SUNY Albany uh, did a lot of the software work on this, and he's an atmospheric scientist. And this was par only part of the team. We really we were a team of about five or six people, but it really was a distributed team. We had the Navy, we had our team in, right over the hill in Massachusetts and Montague, and we got to a point where we really wanted to give up. <laughs> uh, this was a lot harder than we thought. And one of the takeaways is, and this quote is attributed to uh, Edison, often in life, you get stuck. And you have to remember, if this was easy, someone else would have already done this. And you have to kind of enter the beginning phase of the project with, oh, what could possibly go wrong? Because if you don't have that faith in your own abil ability, you'll never get anywhere. At the same time, you have to be a realist. And if you're running out of gas, running out of money, at a certain point, you have, to, you have no other choice but to give up. But it's very important that sometimes you don't realize how close you are. We had a lot of problems. The plane would work great on the ground. We'd get up to 60,000 feet, and nothing worked. We'd go to 50,000 feet, it would work. And you have to get up high enough to get over the hurricane to fly safely. So this turned out to be weeks and then months remotely working in the field, trying to get this to work. You couldn't really simulate the environment. And finally, it was like the layers of the onion. You peel back each layer. Finally, the sucker started working and we got our first hurricane. It turned out the first hurricane was in the Atlantic, the second hurricane in 2015 was in the Pacific, the third hurricane was in the Atlantic, and we were literally hopping on jetliners, going back and forth between these forward bases to ch literally chase storms. Now, the plane has a limited fuel range, so it can only go so far, so you have to forward deploy the plane, which costs another $100,000, so it's a very risky game, and the Navy had to predict when the storm was gonna be five days in advance to logistically allow NASA to get the B-57 into position. So this is Hurricane Joaquin, and these are four different days. This is sort of a mosaic. So day one is on the bottom, day four is on the top. And each of those dots is where we dropped one of our sensors. And we were all flying from uh, Warner Robins Air Force Base in Georgia. And this was the epiphany of, on the first day, it turned out we were 12 hours after the El Faro sank. If you remember, there was a, there was a ship that went back and forth between Florida and Puerto Rico, and it had 33 souls on it, and it sank. And it sank because the forecast was wrong. The captain looked at the NOAA forecast, and he made a bet, and the bet didn't pay off. And a lot of those 33 people were from New England. They went to Mass Maritime or Maine Maritime Academy. It was very sad. And we were watching this on the news while we were in our little control bunker at Warner Robins, and we had no idea, but we were right over it at one point, a few hours afterwards. So we were, we were oversampling the storm. No storm has ever been sampled like this up until this point. And it was very exciting, but it was kind of a sobering moment because the real pain hit home that we're doing this for a reason. It turns out that 50% of our population lives within 50 miles of a coastline. So it's very likely that someone you know will be affected in their lifetime by one of these storms. And it's not, a, it's not a tornado in the terms of it's a tight uh, mess in a certain town. It'll wipe out entire cities. So it's just bound to happen. It happened in New Orleans. It's bound to happen again. But this was a real sort of human aspect that, that hit us. So, by the way, that's the eye of Hurricane Joaquin taken from the camera under the plane. And that shows you how tiny it was. So this was kind of a Frankenstein-like storm. It was a very tight eye, very, very intense. And uh, the next uh, hurricane happened in the Pacific. This was the last one, and this is where it got kind of exciting, because the Navy almost didn't go. We had already chased three storms. We were running low on supplies. They were running low on money, and they said, well, maybe we'll, we'll keep some dry powder for next year. We'll go in 2016. Well, there was one scientist who pounded his fist on the table and said, these are the ideal conditions. This is the storm we've been waiting for, and there was no storm. So this is five days ahead of Patricia, which is what you're looking at track. This is October 21st to 24th in uh, 2015. So we get over the storm on the first day because essentially they couldn't shut Russ up. 
And we get there, and there's no hurricane. And we're all looking at each other like, oh, boy, we just wasted $100,000. This is bad. And the first day, we dropped 13 sensors. And uh, we said, well, maybe we're down here. We might as well wait for a second day. The second day was a Category 1. The third day was a Category 5. This thing rapidly intensified to beat the band. On the fourth day, it was off the charts. It was literally like a Category 7. So this is a bird's eye view of the sensors as we crossed it on the fourth day. And these are the trajectories the sons took. And it took a long time. It, we, we didn't do this instantly. And the science is still pretty young on what I'm about to show you. But what we found is both Hurricane Joaquin and Hurricane Patricia, which turns out to be the strongest hurricane ever observed in the Western Hemisphere, period, end of sentence. This was a monster by any measure. Lowest central pressure, 200 knot plus winds, verified by a plane at 1,000 feet with a radar on it and drops on by the bucket load, and it was tilted like a twister, <laughs> like a water spout. And it turns out that this twist, because we flew one way and we came around and a couple hours flew the other way, orthogonally, we could measure the rotational speed. So just like the Earth's axis that's tilted and it's processing, the Earth causes the seasons, but the, the hurricane, if that axis tilt, that axial tilt, is in phase with the sun coming up. Remember, the sun is pushing all this. It's all thermodynamic. It's the heat input. If it's in phase with the solar signal, then it's like pushing a kid on a swing at the right time. The swing goes higher. You push at the right time, the swing moves. You push at the wrong time, the swing stops. We think that this might be the key to unlocking the intensity forecast, to figure out why, for instance, Hurricane Matthew a couple of months ago became a superstorm all of a sudden. And before that, it wasn't very powerful. So again, the day, days are young for the science, but it looks, it looks promising. There's a picture, by the way, at 62,000 feet, taken by the backseat navigator at Hurricane Patricia. And those cloud towers are just about flight altitude. And this plane, it, it, it's very tough, but it doesn't want to fly. It's flying in a tenth of an atmosphere. It does not want to fly through clouds at 62,000 feet. The plane was coming back with salt on it which nobody could believe. How could salt get up there? This was a super typhoon. It was amazing. By the way, look at the, how dark the sky is. This is the middle of the day. This shows you how little air there is up there because there's no Rayleigh scattering going on, which is what makes the sky blue. So where are we headed? We're headed towards doing this with robots. So the Navy has uh, about 68 Triton UAVs, which is the top on order, and we're going to hopefully put these robots in the back of them so we can fly unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, about 26 people have died surveilling hurricanes in the past 40 or 50 years. It's dangerous work. It's not work for people. It should be done by robots. But the lower left corner is, I think, the real engineering solution. It's kind of crazy to move a 150,000-pound airplane full of people and jet fuel over a storm to drop a 50-gram item. Think about form, fit, and function. It's, it's crazy. What we should be doing is solar-powered drones that sit up there for months powered by the sun and batteries and electricity, and you, you park them up there, and they drop the sensors on command. So they sort of loiter up there. And I think that's the future. So that's where we're headed. But it's, uh, here's the four sequence days of Patricia uh, showing kind of a, the flight pattern. It, it was exciting yet terrifying to get over Patricia. And it was fulfilling in terms of we had accomplished something but it was also at great sacrifice, and that's a cautionary tale, that if you get so pulled into it, and this happens in the movie Twister, that your family forgets where you are or what you're doing, there's a sacrifice involved. And my family sacrificed quite a bit, and uh, also my team's families. And uh, that was uh, an unexpected result, but thankfully they, they stood by me. So it's a cautionary note. Dedicate your something, yourself to do something important, Write down your goals and work towards those goals. Don't let anything stop you. Thank you.